Shanghai GDG is a very interesting、uh, developer community. I'm glad somebody has asked this question. I mean, this is where the magic happens. This is primarily a question and answer show. So, if any of you out there would like to ask questions. <laughs> And we are live. Bravo! Hello. All、yeah. right. Welcome to Google Games Chat number five. Still not canceled. Alto so. cinco.、Mm-hmm. Go. So、um, I guess we should start by apologizing for、um, last week's episode not making it onto YouTube.、Uh, <laughs> Our rep- awesomeness、That's、cannot probably, be compressed. It was probably for the better that that wouldn't.、Uh, and I mean, in in retrospect, I think we probably had a little too much gratuitous nudity. <laughs>、yeah. That.、Um, That, that probably、God. violated. I thought it was artistic. I thought it was artistic, but apparently those. Yeah, we yeah. don't have we don't have a release for those parts of our bodies. The、so. Supreme Court will tell you what's artistic and not. I know it when I see it. I'm just saying. I <laughs> thought it was tastefully done and it was a beautiful thing, but apparently those people at YouTube just did not agree. And so,、um, those of you who who missed last last episode, episode number four, it's been、you、lost. You missed out. That's what I'm saying. I don't、down. think it'll ever happen again. A whole、yeah. lot of Todd. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to move off of this uncomfortable topic and go into some introductions.、Huh. Uh, to, to my left is、uh, Daniel Wolf Dobson, Doctor Daniel Wolf Dobson. I, I no, I'm a doctor, and I play one on Google Developers Live. <laughs> 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 to、uh, my immediate right is Colt McCandless. Say hi, Colt. Hi, Colt. And to, to his right is John McCutcheon. Hey, everyone. All right. So actually, I want to start by asking: You're a doctor? Yeah, I yeah. did not know this until I, like, I, I got I, a bite. I'm not the kind of doctor that does surgery, although maybe the occasional unnecessary surgery. But no,、um, the, I, I have a PhD in、uh, computer science in artificial intelligence.、Um, I worked on intelligent user interfaces, so interfaces that had an idea of what it was you were trying to do, and then kind of because it had a model of what you're doing, it could. Help you do it better, more or less.、Um, uh, old old AI PhDs are not awesome reading because a lot of it is like, well, yeah, that would be a good idea, <laughs> and now here, you know, ten years later, it was a good idea. We should have done that.、Um, is there an example of like this put into practice that that you'd be able to point to and say? Oh, you don't you don't want to you don't want to ask a PhD to talk about their thesis. That、and、is that, probably that, true. That gets ugly quick. But、uh, I will say that、episode. after I after I did some postdoc work doing.、Um, A lot of interesting things,、uh, rendering like Mars rover data and things like that. I was like, I think I'm done with this, and joined、uh, Sega Sports and started working on basketball. <laughs> which, <laughs> Sounds way more fun. Which was very much AI, although、uh, it's interesting because so much of the AI in、uh, console games, especially of that era, is very much、uh, reactive planning, which is、uh, classic. Uh, sort of theory that came out of Uni- University of Chicago about control, and what it really was was this reactive planning from like the early '90s, but you know, elaborated to the nth degree, where we just had tons of code for every possible situation, every frame, you know, deciding what what should the basketball player do next. Well, is he doing this? He's doing this. We have hundreds of heuristics that are all watching, you know, what、oh, should he pass? Should he not pass? If I had the ball, would I have a better shot than if I passed it to Colt? And he had the ball. You know, if I passed the ball to Colt, would he, would it get intercepted? All these things. And you're calculating that every frame. If if you hand me the ball, I generally take the shot. That's how it works. Well, and then you <laughs> doesn't know, matter where we, he is on the yeah, court. I mean,、matter. we ac- you, you actually put in emotion things like that, where it's like you know, a guy like Kobe, he holds onto the ball, <laughs> and he,、um, and it has some funny side effects, which is if you、uh, if you have one character who's really out of balance, he'll never pass because no matter what, he is the best guy with the ball. So yeah, no, uh, I uh, uh, I'm rarely a practicing scientist now, although I still review papers for uh, uh, the AAA conference on computer games. Wow. Very cool.、Nice. Yeah, there's a whole lot about you I did not know. <laughs> so, are, are neural networks like are those passe now? No, no, people、mm. still do neural networks.、Right. Um, there's there, wasn't there, the cat detector a neural network?、Mm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, neural networks are are still very interesting.、Um, there's lots of I mean, machine. I, I had sort of good old fashioned AI kind of stuff where、mm-hmm. we were doing symbolic representations of things. But there is also、uh, you know machine learning is really big. Machine learning in games is uh, very uh, interesting because. Because machine learning is about optimization, a lot of times it doesn't actually sell very well when you're when you're doing it in a game. So if you're playing a football game, and you're doing machine learning on like what kind of plays the guy is doing or something like that, 
um, it will gradually start getting better than you and or being able to predict every move you're going to make and that's not actually that much fun <laughs> you're just like well, it's not fun to continually lose well you, you see well, the thing is fun. You, yeah. you don't see it and you you don't have a if you're doing like this gradual optimization process you don't have any place where you can call attention to it and say like this this is the moment in which i learned something and therefore i will tell you this which is why uh, machine learning you know, so like if you have a, a machine learning thing that's the, a neural network that's driving your car you know, you can't really tell it's being driven by a neural network um, unless you annotate it with a whole bunch of stuff like, oh, he's missed the curve or something like this. Hmm. So um, uh, machine learning is really interesting. It's really interesting in games. Uh, but again, it's, uh, uh, it tends to show up in sort of, uh, sort of quiet ways that you can't quite see it. Um, you have showy stuff instead to sort of like, look at this AI. It's being so smart. That gotcha. tends to be more good old fashioned AI. Uh, what, what do you feel about modern games today? Do you think there's that too much of the AI isn't? Uh, really AI? Because I know a lot of it is pretty much just pre-canned. Oh, right? there, yeah, there, there, you know? there's a there's a <laughs> whole discussion of like you know what you know every every time something gets popular you know the a lot of times the AI establishment says well that was never really AI all along yeah. that was a, that was an optimization problem or something like this. Um, you know I uh, for a long time it was believable agents. You know how could you make sidekicks who were uh, who were believable who seemed like they were alive and things and then at some point we started making games that had believable agents dogs that acted like dogs things like that there's interesting research out of that um <laughs> Daikatana. no uh but like cats c a t z you know the yeah. little pet cats that you could have yep. that, uh, from Brotherbone. i mean that was those were those were moments where like oh believable agents yeah we can do that you know <laughs> ah that's not really ai and, and it goes all the way back to uh computer games learning uh, uh ai learning how to play chess mm -hmm. you know at some point ah oh, that's not chess that's just a search problem you know uh or that's not ai that's search um, well that's that's the goal right i mean like yeah. chemistry uh, is really just physics which is really just yeah you know. exactly um well, what i would say about uh games not really having real ai what i what i would actually say about that is that um you only need to add as much ai to your game to make it fun um, so there are situations like if you play, you know, Yakuza or something like that, the AI for the guys getting out of your way as you're running through the crowd is sort of silly looking. You know, they, they sort of stagger and they pop to these weird animations and all that sort of stuff. But you know what? It's good enough. I can mm -hmm. get through the crowd. They get out of my way. And so I think a lot of people, especially when I was, uh, you know, in grad school, I would play these games and think, Oh my gosh! You know, if they just used our awesome, you know, super advanced algorithms, it wouldn't do this. And then when you think about it, it's like it's not really worth the money to get it that beautiful, um, or to make it that sort of seamless. And if it is perfect and seamless, you don't even notice how good it is. Right, yeah. so, um, well, not just the money, but also the computation, right? Mm, like oh, that much, was <coughs> how much computational yeah. effort how much is can it you worth? Spend towards yeah, exactly. towards uh, like crowd algorithms when you don't really notice. Well, uh, exactly. I mean, if it's happening, if and or if uh, I mean, a classic example of this is playing first-person shooters. You know, if your sidekicks are not, uh, if you're playing a single-player game and your sidekicks are not visible, they could be doing anything, and in fact, they usually are. They're teleporting around. They're doing mm -hmm. crazy stuff because it does not matter <laughs> what they're doing because you can't see them. Um, I have noticed occasionally, like if you know some follower, I think this happens in Skyrim. Some follower, you know, isn't able to sort of pathfind to where I am. Just keep going, and eventually they like turn the corner. Yep, they're and they're going. right there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, and if you think about that, you know, that's it's good enough. <coughs> um, if you're involved in playing your game and the guy is there at the right moment, you don't really think about did he successfully path plan his How way from point A to point B. Now, there's been interesting cases of that. Wasn't it Fable or Fable Two? One of the two had like a mission you could send your horse on or something like you could you could move a zone and move another zone and then like the horse would still try to follow you like through these zones and in the process would of course take damage and gain experience points along the way and <laughs> there was this interesting video on the net where like someone was like okay horse stay and then he went like two zones away and he like whistled for his horse and the horse came back like two levels higher or something <laughs> like that because it mm -hmm. killed mice along the way well, or and, and, and you know I th it's beautiful and as, a, as an AI <laughs> developer I think that's so cool <laughs> as a uh, uh, you know as somebody who would be budgeting that game I would say to myself why did we spend all this money on off screen horses <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I, if, if I could get three more good horses on screen, I would totally skip the horse <laughs> <laughs> playing the game by itself. All right, we're going to move along to our Sorry. next topics. No, this is this well, is this totally is great. We could totally I, I, do it. Clearly, we, there's a we there's an, an AI entire, episode, an yes. entire episode mm -hmm. just on game AI. There's there's oh, a lot more a lot to talk fun. about. But we're going to move into our uh, five for five section five where we yeah we pick uh, five topics that we're going to talk about for five minutes. I actually have my stopwatch set for five minutes thirty seconds because hmm. I want us to have a little extra time. And uh, 
we always go over anyway. He's feeling generous today. Yeah. Yes, I am. Um, so I'm going to start with um, a comment that Colt had made right before this episode, mm. which is basically declaring that 3D was dead. You and uh, why, why don't you? Uh, Back up this claim, and so then we'll all tell you why you're Unlike wrong. Our, our completely uncontroversial statements about game AI, now we're going to say whether 3D is dead. Well, no, no, no. Dead. So, so let, me, let me preface this. So I, I'm a graphics programmer, traditionally. That's what, Before I came to Google, I spent time in the industry as a systems and graphics programmer, like mm -hmm. hardcore. The question that I had today was, uh, is where does 3D fit in our modern gaming ecosystem? Right. We saw over the trend of a couple console cycles that the amount of cost to create these movie production games skyrocketed, mostly due to the advances in 3D rendering. But what we've seen now is that the move to casual mobile social doesn't require the same sort of Hollywood backdrop, right? We've seen better experiences coming out of 2D environments and more creativity coming from low cost development. In addition to that, with the move to mobile, right, your little stopwatch mm -hmm. right there, we actually find that 3D, these things aren't really set up to do 3D well, right? It burns through the battery, it burns through the chips, it does, you know, it takes a lot more away from the user. So the question is, you know, besides the console, is 3D really the next step for like tablet mobile or is that really an ecosystem that should be dominated by 2D? And the same thing for the web. Is there a spot mm -hmm. for 3D on the web? So. so production values for 3D content are extremely high. Yeah. and mobile titles sell for very little. You can't really sustain like a multi-million dollar game budget when you're selling your unit for 99 cents. Mm -hmm. Well, unless you're making Infinity Blade and selling it for <laughs> yes. however much it is now. 9.99 or yeah. something like that. I mean, it could be that 3D is the thing that, that persuades people that this game is worth, yeah, 4.99 mm -hmm. instead of 99 cents or instead of free to play. Sure, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I still think that like modern, like really high quality AAA games sell mm -hmm. for $70 a pop, right? And they are in development for four years and have huge, uh, uh, you know, armies of programmers and artists. And even selling a game for $10, it's hard to uh, recoup those costs, I think. Well, but so, some of that, uh, I mean, it, some of that is tools. Um, if you have good tools, you don't need that army of programmers. Uh, what you need sure. is an army of artists. Unless you're, unless you're writing a really problem. good AI algorithm. <laughs> then it does it for you. And then it does yeah. it, it no, the but, but how much, how much so of this? Yeah, actually, in all yeah. seriousness, uh, you know, I, I read a paper about that a while ago <laughs> uh, where they were actually generating, uh, uh, generating buildings mm -hmm. complete, filled with everything down to like pencils on the desk from, you know, basically oh. AI algorithms. So, yeah, that, that's great if you want to like have kind of if you have a whole bunch of geometry like a city that can very easily be procedurally generated, right? Like it, it's, we all kind of know what a city looks like, but gamers of like 3D games and gamers expect very cinematic experiences, which is essentially like you are scripting a movie scene that the player gets to like kind of play through. And in that case, it's difficult to procedurally generate that because you, you know, the well, helicopter uh, has to come in now and blow this like city block up at that moment. Uh, See, I don't, I don't know if all this is necessarily has in necessarily anything to do with it being in 3D versus people just sort of wanting kind of big set piece kinds of games. Um, you know, I mean, there's, you know, if if you take something like, um, uh, why am I blanking on it? Minecraft. Um, yeah. You know, obviously 3D game, obviously sort of still simplistic kind of stylized art style. Um, you know, was done fairly inexpensively. Um, you know, it's not like there is anything inherent in 3D that I think sort of makes it more expensive so much as people kind of want the, they want sort of the big games, they want the big experiences. And if somehow 3D had never been invented and we were still doing 2D, we would be complaining about the cost of hiring all these animators to hand draw all these cells and how, you know, I think, you know, we'd be talking about resolutions are getting bigger, so sprites are getting bigger, and, you know, my God, everyone wants to customize everything, and, you know, we, we want love, 60 I, I frames a second. I feel like there's an alternate universe, like, 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 uh, <laughs> TV show, if 3D was never invented. So here's, we'll put it, Those we'll put guys it would be saying, if only things were in 3D, then we wouldn't have to spend only I had so a Z buffer. 90 frames, yeah, you know, so drawing this, this walk way. cycle. Let's do it this way. Uh, mm -hmm. Google fires you today. You start a game company. Is your game 3D or 2D? <laughs> Depending on Go. how this show goes. Yeah. <laughs> Is your game 3D or 2D? You start a game studio, Google fires you. Is your game 3D or 2D? Oh, gosh. I th it absolutely comes down to what I'm building. Well, yeah. no, no, right now. Is it 3D <coughs> or 2D? 2D. 2D? 2D, dumb. Uh, two and a half D. I'd probably do. Oh, I, so. nice. I, I would probably do 3D because it would be a differentiating factor. Mm. Uh, 
I, mean, I oh, think, yeah, same. Daniel Daniel Cook had a really interesting point, which was like, if you're a small budget developer, um, you know, you can't compete on sort of massive art right. budgets. So you go for the stylized stuff. And when you kind of stop and think about it, every you know every indie game, whether it's 3D or 2D, you know, something like Fez is is still kind of done in sort of a, a stylized art style, so that you don't it's actually funny care that you whether. Bring it's that up because uh, this week Mike Acton just asked his Twitter followers, like, "Hey, do you think that like the the push towards realistic graphics is like improving or harming the quality of games?" And the very non-scientific poll came back saying people don't like it as much. They would, they prefer the stylized approach. So. Uh, yeah, I and mean, I, I would have to say I often like games that are stylized. Like I think mm -hmm. one of the prettiest games I've ever played was Wind Waker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that game is just beautiful, and it looks nothing like real life, but it looks like an awesome cartoon. Yeah, uh, g going back a little bit. Yeah, I mean, with, like the, with, the, with the about the tools, though. I mean, this is like part of the reason why you know if you are if if I were starting my game studio, I would think about 3D because everybody can do 2D. And if I have the special skills and find the right people and invest in the pipeline at the beginning, I mean, this is what makes why 2D is cheap and 3D is expensive. 3D, you've got to set up a pipeline, you've got to get, you know, a rig, animation, all this stuff. Um, <clears throat> and you have to figure out how to get those into your game in some, some sane way. And there are tools like Unity where they do some of that for you, but you still have to build the pipeline from your modelers to, your, to the motion models and to the game finally. And that's very expensive. It's a big upfront cost. Mm -hmm. With a 2D game, dude, I just got to get some sprites up there, and that's all I need. But the, the, for, for every level I add on to the 3D game, I have to do a lot less work. And then for every level I have to add, a, you know, for that you know, is true. each More new animation cost. costs exactly the same for a, a 2D game, but each new animation in my 3D game costs almost nothing because I'm just moving the rig around. All right, well, we're going to move we're on. Out of time. We're, we're out of time. Um, next topic. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Dart. Dart as a, a, a language. Um, obviously, yeah, we've, we've, been, we've been chatting about it quite a bit here yeah, at yeah. Google. Um, it's how exciting. Do, it's a really cool language. Yeah. I mean, how do we think it's going to affect the game industry? How do you think game developers could, could make use of Dart? You know, you know who really knows about this is What's JJ. It? Shh, dude. Don't, don't say JJ's name aloud. If you do, if you say it three times, he appears. Who? JJ? JJ. <laughs> ah! Did somebody say my name? Oh, jeez. How long have you been down there? <laughs> oh my god, down he lives there! there. No. <laughs> you really don't want to know. Dude, don't look in that coffee can. It's uh, <laughs> We're going to start. <laughs> so, oh, hi, JJ. Hey, buddy. Howdy. How's it going? Did not it's expect nice that. Here. So, um, JJ, by the way, everyone is uh, introduce yourself to the, to the crowds. Hi, I'm JJ Burns. I'm a developer advocate for Dart. All right. Excellent. So, why don't you tell us why should game developers care about Dart? Why, what what do they need to know about Dart? Hmm. <coughs> does the, does it increase your cloaking ability? Apparently. <laughs> yes. Um. Well, you know, the thing about building um, web games these days is that you know it's hard, and the larger the game is, the the harder it is because JavaScript wasn't really built uh, for coding in the large. I mean, it's just, you know, when it first came out, you know, web apps didn't really exist. And so Dart kind of tries to retrofit and fix a lot of those problems, uh, you know, with optional static typing. I, I like to say that it's kind of a scalable language in that it scales with the size of your project. If, you know, if I wanted to build a game with 100 developers and a million lines of code, I want to do it in Dart, not JavaScript. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and so, um, and I guess we've sort of talked about this before in previous in, uh, in in previous discussions. But Dart does compile essentially into JavaScript if you are on a browser that does not support native. Yeah, Dart. so that's right. There's a VM that's been integrated into um, a fork of Chromium, and that's called Dartium. Uh, but you know, since almost no one runs Dartium, we have it compiling down to JavaScript. And one of the interesting things about that is that. Uh, the Dart to JS compiler can actually compile JavaScript. Hold on, hold on. Jimmy's telling us something. What's that? Oh, oh sorry. picking up. Hey. Oh. <laughs> uh, That's why we had this mic sitting yeah, here this whole time. Sorry, in Lewis. case some random person <laughs> living in our studio <laughs> yeah, popped up. In case somebody's cut a hole in the, the whole back time, of the I'm studio. The whole time I'm like, what is, what is this through? thing? Why is this over here? Like, I'm leaning away. I thought it was like a, a, a stage <laughs> mic. Anyway, let's. So um, uh, the Dart to JS guys, they're pretty amazing in that they're not trying to do just a like straightforward like one-to-one -one translation between 
uh, JavaScript um, between Dart and JavaScript, but rather they're applying all kinds of interesting optimizations. So a lot of times the JavaScript that they could uh, can compile down to is actually faster than the JavaScript that you could write by hand. Hmm because they could do all kinds of tricks like inlining and so forth. And so you'll see this once in a while. If you if you end up like looking at the generated JavaScript, it's like, whoa, look at what they did to my, my code. I mean, it's that's not what I wrote, but it's kind of kind of brilliant. So. So, so for game developers out there who don't have exposure to Dart but come from the web, what, what are the big three things they should know? Like if they're an ActionScript developer or a Flash developer, what, what are the three things they should know that make Dart awesome? So let me see. I would think of it like in terms of the three types of programmers. So if you're an action script uh, three developer, I think that you're going to find Dart very uh, familiar because, you know, the syn syntactically it's somewhere between JavaScript and Java. It's got this op optional static types thing. So I think that the action script uh, three developer will find it very comfortable. Now if you're a JavaScript uh, guy, you know, you might be used to tools not uh, helping you out enough. Uh, not catching errors early enough, not being able to refactor in ways, not understanding your code well enough. And I think that the Dart editor is going to really surprise you in what it can do. Um, now, the third way, uh, if you're um, from like a C-sharp uh, Java background, you're probably used to like really, really solid development tools mm -hmm. like Visual Studio and IntelliJ. And uh, you might look at JavaScript and say, ah, I, I, you know, I just can't do it. You know, I know that John said this before. <laughs> there that, are like, no rules in JavaScript. You know, like, <laughs> There's no rules. JavaScript That's what is I love about JavaScript. Yeah, there are no you, rules. If you could think like a Lisp guy or, you know, Python, Perl, Ruby hacker, then JavaScript makes a lot of sense. But, like, if you're coming from C-sharp C Java background, it might be a little bit frustrating. And I think that Dart alleviates a lot of that frustration. Okay, so spe speaking of somebody who has a PhD in AI, I I freaking love Lisp. That's going to be Sorry, nice. I'm, I'm distracting from you. So hold on, quick, quick question here. So uh, game <laughs> development game development's all about performance, yes. right? When it comes down to the metal, we care about how you can iterate over the arrays, how we can optimize for that. So what does Dart bring to the table for, for games that care about performance? So actually, I think John could talk about this a little bit. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I've been working with the, the Dart VM team to make this fast, to, to make things like vector math faster. Hmm under the Dart VM than it is currently possible in any other language. So by extending access to floating point arrays so that you can do things like invert a 4x4 matrix that's stored inside an array using the SIMD extensions that your CPU has, these sorts of algorithms can be like greatly accelerated. Fantastic. So we can do fast linear algebra. We can do transforms. Yes. We can do uh, well, processing. That's great. Tell me about debugging tools. Like uh, when so I'm trying to live debug awesome Dart. Tell this me. is an awesome thing. Dart has an ID, it has tools, it has a type system, and you set breakpoints in your editor. Yeah, so, so really, it's yeah, you, you, it's all the way there. You set That's breakpoints awesome. in the editor, you launch your application, it's running in Dartium, breakpoint hits, it goes back to the editor, there you go, you can like fan out your variables, look at Ooh. your call stack. Look at your stack, yeah, look at it's your variables. Really Mouse nice. over a variable in the source code and it'll show you the value. Yeah. And, and is the plan to, to migrate that from Dartium to Chromium? I think that in, in the future that's a possibility. Cool, great. So um, I'll st I'll end with one final question. So, you know, obviously in JavaScript right now, there's a you know a lot of libraries, Box Duty for physics, you know, mm -hmm. stuff to kind of help manage, um, you know, manage graphics, all of that. Like Dart, my impression is you know it's just kind of it's just starting as a language. Are those are those oh. libraries available, <laughs> and can I use them just as JavaScript? Like what, so, how does that work? So I would break the uh, the libraries into two categories. Uh, there are the things like jQuery, mm -hmm. and I, I always like to say that Dart is its own jQuery because Dart provides a nicer uh, API for the DOM. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the Box 2D, there's a port of... Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. there's a port being developed by uh, Dominic Hammond, who works mm -hmm. at Google. Okay. And I've actually been working with him on optimizing my vector math library for the Box 2D port. All right. Yeah. And what about I graphics? Have a, I have a graphics engine, uh, which presents something closer to console graphics APIs and DirectX 11 graphics APIs mm. okay. rather than WebGL. And then a kind of demo, like higher level library that sits on top of that that allows you to have like a dynamically 
hot reloadable uh, scene graph and like all kinds of animations and things like that. And this is this is public, right? You got this on yeah, your it's repo. All, it's all on my GitHub. Yeah, that's a really nice thing about uh, Dart is that it is fully open source and developed in the open. And so you could look at, you know, John and I yelling at each other over, our, you know, code reviews and so forth. Over a lot of fun. Every, I, I, every break. I, I actually yeah. can frequently hear that. Yeah, well, you know. All the way from 1950s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I'm just heated. sitting in 1900 yeah. and I can hear you guys shouting at each other. It's true. So, uh, well, thank you very much for um, <laughs> dropping. Uh, wh yeah, what are you going to do now? Are you just going to yeah, hang out? Dude, i got to go back to work, man. Right. I can't, like, <laughs> pop up during every GDL, man. i got <laughs> birth to do. you got to remember not <laughs> to say, not to say his name again. <laughs> <laughs> and he's out. JJ, out. I'm out. Shh, careful, don't say his name three times. Yeah, I <laughs> have to come back. <laughs> I'm going to let you finish about your dart talk. <laughs> but, but that VM was the best. All right. That, that uh, I did not I'm, know I, he was I, back I, then. Uh, I'm frightened now. What's the next subject? You know <laughs> we we do we have more people back there? Next time we need to get Sergey back there. Have that him pop up with some Google Glass. That would be fantastic. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll talk to him about Jimmy, it. I'm can sure. you send an email on that? But saying his name three times does not make him appear. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next topic. Um, we didn't really talk. We sort of missed this last time. Valve, big mm. picture mode on Steam. The yes. big picture. And uh, you know, presumably at some point, some type of Valve specific hardware coming out. What do we think about all this? I think it's pretty exciting. Valve's invest been investing heavily in OpenGL, and in particular Linux uh, performance. Mm -hmm. So. If I were to take a guess, I would say that whatever Valve is producing is going to be running Linux mm -hmm. because of how much they've been publicly putting into mm -hmm. R&D on the uh, Linux OpenGL stack. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really exciting. I, at some point in time, kind of stopped gaming on my PC because I like the idea of sitting around on the couch. I missed that experience of like hanging out with friends in the living room, playing the games, and that seems to be what the Steambox big picture mode is all about. Well, one one of the reasons why I, I mean I'm a huge Steam fan, and yeah. it like one of the things that's great about it is it just works. You know, like when you download a game and you play it, it just works. As opposed to have, have you tried every, Big Picture Mode? Every other no, game? I haven't tried Big Picture Mode, but I'm saying just in general, oh, just they, they have this yeah. experience that to me as a console mm -hmm. developer, it felt like console games. Mm -hmm. You know, you just go, you click in the game you want to play, you hit play, and you're playing the game often. Um, yeah. But uh, th with the uh, you know when you're installing the game off discs, you know I, I remember there was this point where I w it took me I think I started Doom three seven times trying to get it like the settings in some sane way in which I p people's faces weren't peeling off and stuff. It's just like I'm Not never even part of the game. <laughs> yeah. That was that was, <laughs> <a> <laughs> that was no no but yes. it was during the opening cutscenes which they were clearly not you're always uh. seeing the back of people and the back uh. of people's faces and stuff and I was like I'm never was it that oh no sorry it was just getting it was getting incredibly uh, like Terry mm -hmm. uh, and I was like okay that I, I I'm, I'm like I'm never I'm never playing no, on a PC I, again like I would love to have all of the games that are on Steam in my living room on my TV holding some kind of gamepad mm -hmm. I would. If they, if they if they can agree on the on the gamepad layout, yeah. then it's a wonderful thing because you can then code to that, <coughs> and it's a. And you actually get to target like PC games and like this new meta console. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of like so? You mentioned that right? If everyone can agree on a on a controller well, layout, that, I mean, that is, is, is that the logical flow? Uh, well, that's pretty important. Um, you well, know, like we have all agreed that there's a keyboard and there's a mouse, mm -hmm. and that the keys are in this order, unless you're like a Dvorak person. But <laughs> even those people, when they're sitting down to play, play uh, uh, yeah, Team Fortress. Yeah, what's the, <laughs> what's, what's the like WASD? Yeah, exactly. It's like you gotta play like no, this. It's Dvorak. Yeah, it's like Q. Dvorak. Yeah. Every every game you just type Dvorak over and over and over. Yeah. So, so, so but but in all seriousness, like so like th th this this the controls are controls are what make games, and you need to make sure that the th yes. the thing that you're touching is the same. So if you know one guy is sitting there and it's like, yeah, I just press this button, it puts on the handbrake, and I can spin around turns. The other guy's like, I have to left trigger and press the left joystick at the same time, and I can't, you know. Actually, that's a great point. I mean, it, if they were to present some kind of like Steambox home console. The quality of the gamepad is key. I mm -hmm. mean, it, if if it's just take any gamepad off of the Best Buy shelves, I don't think it'll be that good of an experience. But if there is a, this is the Steambox gamepad, that not a yeah. gamepad. We need what, to go back to Power Glove. Power, oh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So Make it happen, Nintendo. Yeah, bring it back. 
What we we gave you the Wii. What do you want? It's not in glove <laughs> form. Yeah. Uh, so the que- here's my question for everybody: Is uh, what's driving this? Like in in reality, I, I think we can all agree that Steam is a fantastic product. It's been probably, in, in, in my personal opinion, keeping gaming on desktops alive. Uh, I think they have done a huge service yeah. to the PC absolutely, gaming industry. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, when we saw consoles taking over, we saw a big trend there. Even the switch to mobile and web now, I think it's safe to say that it, Steam is still standing alone. Why the move to console, right? Well, what's, so what's driving that? Gabe has come out and said that he's very unhappy with Windows 8 hmm. and doesn't think that that's going to deliver as good of an experience for gamers. I believe he used the word catastrophe. Yes, yeah, it was very strong. It was very, strong it was very strongly Gabe, worded. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you know, some clearly some of this is, you know, from, um, you know, it appears as though Microsoft is going to put its own sort of version of Steam into the operating system. I think it's going to make oh. it, you know, well, I, I don't exactly know, you know, what they're doing, but I think they they want to make their own app store that is probably going to be a lot more um, visible than, you know, whatever mm-hmm. you would have mm-hmm. to do to get to Steam. I haven't used Windows 8. I don't know. This is all just speculation. But also, there's kittens everywhere. But, you know, clearly no, they're, that, they're that, saying, that's, gee, that's we're Google. awfully. <laughs> that's YouTube. <laughs> we're awfully tied to, you know, sort of. We're, we're, they are kind of at the mercy of one, you know, possibly two, you know, companies that are not them, um, you know, running these, you know, uh, I'd, these I'd, platforms. I'd, I just think the other thing is that it's the, it's the continuous upgrade. You know, like I, I find this with car electronics that, you know, <clears throat> my wife has a car that's got a built in maps thing and, or built in uh, 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 GPS and the radio and whatever. And my incredibly old car, I have an aftermarket thing that I just put my Android phone in. And every time I buy a better Android phone, my car gets better, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think the same thing goes with uh, with the the Steambox experience or this this big s- picture experience, which is, you know, it's been how long since the Xbox 360 came out? You know, like like waiting for these hardware cycles uh, for the console industry. You know, especially where we're we're at this point where 3D games with you know thousand you know three thousand polygons per character look about the same as games with seven thousand polygons per character. You know, like at that point. Eh, what, what's the hurry to upgrade? But if you're a hardcore gamer, and I think Steam definitely play, uh, leans into that hardcore uh, market, you're going to keep upgrading your PC as you go along, which means your console is going to get your console, your big picture is going to get better, better and better as you go along. So it's it's a sort of well, a that kind of goes against the whole dedicated Steam Box idea. Yeah, I would really well, but the trick with that is that they could they could keep releasing Steam Box Two, Steam Box Three, Steam Box Four, and since they're all PC games at their heart, they're just going to keep getting better. Sure, but I mean, I think one of the biggest reasons why I moved away from PC gaming was because of that upgrade treadmill, which was every year a new game came out it required a new GPU and a new faster CPU. But that, that, that made, tr- it, but yeah, it made you feel awesome when you mm. went down to the store and you're like, sure, put down yeah. your six hundred dollars. It was for a lot of fun, but <laughs> you know, console games also continue to look better and you know get uh-huh. better as the life cycle goes on because they figured a way to extract more performance out of. Although I think we're, say we're it's, on the it's other nice, side of that curve yeah. at this point. It, I don't know. Enough. It is yeah. nice knowing yeah. that you know a console game is come is coming out, and I just know it will work on my Xbox. Yes. Like, well, I don't so have I to think worry. That, that's I, agree. I have to look yeah. at the specs. Hey, we, we, we got we to gotta, we gotta move on. We got to move on. We got to move on to uh, this is a uh, question from from Doctor Dobson. Um, who's your favorite sidekick? In yeah, the that's a real scientific question, right? Well, yeah, and it's well, it's a good one, kind of, because we've been talking about AI, we've talking about the. Fable horse. Luigi. So um, I w- I'll give you. I will give you two favorite uh, sidekicks. Okay. The first one is uh, Alex from Half Life, Episode Two, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. there they really spent the time lingering on her emotional state as part of yours, like how she feels about this world. I, I went through and played the beginning of it again just the other day, and I was just, I was like, wow, this is really neat. Like I know what she's feeling because I'm looking at her face and sort of seeing well, what's going Freeman on. Freeman is like a is blank, right? So well, he's like, you. Like, yeah, he's he, you. He's, yeah. he's every man. And so she's kind of like reflecting emotions that like you should, you should probably be feeling yeah. like back onto you. So but it's but a, it's but a she great, she uh, you know I wanted to go on an adventure with her forever. I, I felt the same. You know, it's like it was just like this is great. I mean, except that world is sort of a horrible one to live in. But that's <laughs> that's, that's a different problem. Besides all the death um, and but the hey, robots at least and the aliens. She's here. But she's <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. But at least I have somebody that, to sh- who that should be. The, for some reason, that tells me that should be like a Hallmark card. Like besides yeah. the aliens and yes. the the robots. You are the girl for, for being me. Here. Fascist no. government system. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I also think that that the fact that she doesn't go and get herself killed all the time is. Super important. That's helpful. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, you yeah. don't 
get she, frustrated with them. Well, she you know she she takes sort of logical cover. She falls back when she's supposed to, mm -hmm. and she 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 isn't clearly invincible, but uh, in practice, it turns out she is. Um, the other thing, uh, uh, the uh, the other companion uh, is the uh, D that you get in NetHack that follows you around at the beginning. Who, if if you play like I do, when you finally run out of food on level four, you you, you kill them and eat them. It's mm. like not only a best friend, but also a yeah. meal. And uh, uh, I just want to tell you all that. Uh, why, why do I, I think I, that, that, that I, Wolf is going to quit Google one day and make a Half Life 2 meets NetHack clone where in level yeah. four he's really conflicted? He's got a real eat? big problem. Yeah. For like a week, he's just like, what did I do? Yeah, yeah it's, it's alive, the, the game. In game form. <laughs> wow, I'm really running out of food here. Yeah, wow, that is like a whole different version of Oregon Trail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. one of us made it, <laughs> <laughs> and we all sort of made it because you're part of me now. Yeah. The Donner Party <laughs> edition of Oregon Trail. <laughs> all right, uh, all I'm right, done. John. Uh, got a cult. I got to think about this. Uh, so I'm going to go back to a Val favorite and actually say Glados. Oh, I thought you were going to go with the companion cube. I was not going to go with the companion cube. I think I think that's a little overdone. A lot of people m underestimate uh, the drive that Glados brings to the table. She motivates you. Absolutely. Are, are you talking them? Are you, number you're one talking or two when she's in the potato? Uh, I I'm spoiler. I, I, yeah, sorry. Yeah, what's well, up with that, dude? Dude, come on. I, how are people you? Because I am a potato. Two year old game yet? Yes. Yeah. No, in Portal One, I, I think I think mm -hmm. uh, what what they did. No, to she bring, is she's a wonderful companion. She was an amazing amazing companion and sidekick in that stable. I mean, she got you where you needed to go. She motivated motivated you, even if it meant giving you the pointy end of the stick, um, yeah. even though she tried to kill you, which I think that all good sidekicks should try to kill their... If you uh, make the dog mad, NetHack, he will come after you. Uh, well, it's because he saw what you did to the D. <laughs> there you go. Kind of a, along the same lines as Alex, I've really enjoyed the sidekicks that you get in Uncharted games. Mm. Yes. Like they are really oh, Elena, alive. Elena is another yeah. example of it. Yeah. Th there was a wonderful moment in Uncharted 3 where, uh, or 2, I guess it is, where you're walking, you're walking through Nepal and, like, your two ex-girlfriends are fighting with you, you know, are arguing yeah. and talking about you, and you're just, and you know, you're kind of like, you know, it the character feels is doing it so <laughs> natural. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, when I'm walking through yeah. the streets of Nepal, it just it brings no, back no, so many it, memories. No, no, but but in all seriousness, the fact that they were having this wonderful conversation that was completely grounded in the in the the story that you're having, yeah. and it was bringing their characters forward, is amazing. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go with. I got I got two two picks. Um, one would probably be the the dog or cat in Torchlight. Because oh, um, yeah. they're uh, useful. Mm -hmm. You they're know like that dog is getting like a fifty percent cut of everything. <laughs> he's taking back to the surface. Yeah. I don't care. I don't care. He's going back to town for me, doing doing all the work that I don't want to do. This is what younger so. siblings were for. When <laughs> you were growing up. Yeah. Back on the farm. <laughs> yeah. Sure, he's embezzling money from me, but I don't care. And number. <laughs> You have to audit the dog later. <laughs> it's a really boring video He's game. He's got a great lawyer. <laughs> Weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, I'll go with that. Uh, was HK47? Uh, kill Nikeo all the meat bags. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I meat love that. Guy. He was. This is the best robot ever. He was the anti C3PO. Yeah. Uh, really for was. those of you who haven't played the game in uh, uh, Knights of the Old Republic, you could you got a droid sidekick and. His his thesis was kill all the meat bags. <laughs> like he, he barely tolerated you, and like any any human, he was just like it was it was the polar opposite of every robot that had ever been in Star Wars. It was wonderful. Was, yep, an assassin awesome. assassin robot, and he was hilarious. I like that term meat bag. I never really <laughs> thought of us <laughs> as bags. Of you meat have this bags. whole conversation with him about like why did you call me meat bag? And he's like, well, it's kind of what you are. Your bags and you're full of meat and. You know. <laughs> It's sort of fifth element style, like, yeah. are you humanoid? Identify yourself. Negative, I am a meat popsicle. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's move on to... Do we got time? Uh, we're kind of running low. Maybe we should just go into what we're playing. And I think we're doing what we're playing. Fifth topic for, for next time. Okay. So, Colt. all right, we'll go... go th we'll start start with no. Colt. No, no, he deferred right, last Start with time. John. Right You're right. What are you playing? Uh, what are you playing? All right, so we, we, I am We've playing heard your trials with 100 floors. Yes, I've been playing 100 floors <laughs> a lot lately. Gotcha! And that's... Uh, I win again. It is a, a frustrating experience, but it just keeps pulling me back. I keep it's going it. to my phone. I'm like, all right, I'm going to make it through this floor. It's and such just, a slot machine of, of like, I got it, I got it! Oh. Yeah, some of the stages, I just... I, as soon as I see the layout of the stage, I'm like, oh, duke, 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 and I'm, and I'm on to the next floor. And then other ones, I'm stuck for like a day. <laughs> and... In Tell the me, end, it, the it actually, in the end, when I succeed, it makes sense. I'm kind of like, yeah, I see that. and But there's just something about the game has these rough edges that kind of like drives you away 
from the obvious answer, but the answer is always obvious. It's like a programmer question. Yeah. <laughs> like, what are you not assuming? Yeah. Yes. All right, Colt, what are you playing? Uh, I'm actually uh, playing a handful of games that are uninteresting. I'm actually, uh, if you've been following my uh, Twitter feed or my G Plus feed, then you're probably aware that I'm, I'm working on trying to analyze streaming algorithms and how to get large game worlds streamed off of disk and through the internet and whatnot. And so I'm actually going back to the table. And I'm actually trying to play a lot of different games that have done streaming very well and very bad and sort of take a technical look at them. So I've been looking at the elevator scenes in Mass Effect 2. Uh, I've been taking a look at the streaming system inside of the Source Engine for Valve. I think they do a great job of it there. Uh, a lot of open world engines with low load times like uh, GTA and Jack and Daxter and those sorts of games. Run backwards in Jack and Daxter. Yeah, exactly, right? And so so just kind of taking a look at a handful of these things and see see how people are solving the problem. Where is where is the technical hurdles? How did they solve them? Uh, see if I can't grok any information out of it. And if you're watching the show and you've got a good experience with streaming large worlds, please send me an email, send me a tweet. I'd love to talk with you more about it. Cool. As for me, let's say I got three games on... Uh, I'm still playing Skyrim, and that will probably be a standard answer for, for quite a while now. Took an arrow to the knee. <laughs> um, I am playing The Walking Dead. Really? That's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, it, is it working for you? Yeah. Are you saying you had technical problems? No, no. Working for you, like, like I wasn't sure how that would translate to a point-and-click adventure. So it... It works really well as sort of a kind of piece of storytelling. Like the mood is really good, the setting is really good, the characters are interesting, the dialogue is well written. You kind of, you know, I, I sometimes, you know, you sort of play it with, and it, it really kind of gets you into the feeling of like, I am in a world where zombies have taken over. At times that, you know, I'll sort of, you know, I'll, I'll finish <laughs> yeah, playing, yeah. I'm ready to go to bed, I'm like, I'm going to lock the door because I don't want the zombie just to, to come in. And then I realized, no, wait, that, that was just the game. <laughs> um, the actual <laughs> gameplay itself is not particularly interesting. Um, you know, it's a fair number of conversation trees that I've sort of realized now looking at sort of a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of game facts often don't seem to have an effect. No. Like, you always you, get you, the next conversation. You're entertaining yourself yeah. by answering these questions. And then the standard kind of adventure game puzzle type of things that... Uh, use skunk with white paint. Use white paint on fence. Mm-hmm. Use fans to get splinter. But it is slight... I, I will say it, their, their puzzles are more logical than your typical adventure games, which... You Better know, puzzles than 100 floor or worse? Different. Yeah. 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 floor is it's very, like... Th- that's like, hey, we're... That that's like mist in God, sort of, it, and this yeah. is like, yeah. you know, um, yeah, Monkey Island style. Ah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, great game. Great game. yeah. But anyway, um, but I I would say you know just sort of um, as as a just sort of interesting piece of storytelling, it's totally worth it. So cool. check it out if you haven't. And then on mobile, I am playing. <laughs> I picked this up on the twenty five cent sale yesterday. Let's create pottery, which is a uh, is a you know sort of pottery making game that. After playing it, I'm like, this is so obvious. Why didn't anyone put a pottery wheel on a mobile touch device before? It's oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You're just like, I'm gonna push it in here and pull it out here, and There's you get this space. There's actually a really awesome tech demo for uh, that comes with move controllers for the, the PlayStation hmm. 3 SDK, where it's essentially that. Like, you hold one move controller and you use the trigger, and it like spins this like long tube of something, and then you use the other one, and you kind of like lathe in like. I thought, you were, I thought you that was going to matter. I, like, I didn't, the I didn't of the know games where that for the move controller, which required you to like dance around the vase. And, like, no, like it some with your of hips. the tech demos available to developers with the move controller are the most amazing usages of like one-to-one motion tracking that you've ever seen. Like being able to like spin this thing and like pull and have it like come out and like make all these like weird swords and like clubs and things like that. Hmm. It's so creative and fun. Wow. Uh, so for my. Uh, uh, I'm also playing a zombie game, but I'm playing Lone Survivor, which mm-hmm. is the, it's a 2D game that was oh, clearly, right. it's very pixely, and you shouldn't be frightened of it, and I can only play it for about half an hour at a time. And then I'm like, I don't want to go down that hallway. I think I'm going to do, I'm going to go work on something else. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, I've been playing 30, like 31 minutes a day of this game. Um, what, what platform is that on? Uh, it's on, uh, it's on, it's on Steam. Steam. I'm playing on it on Steam. Ma- I'm playing it on a Mac, but it's uh, on PC as well. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's tight. 
Uh, it's that's the sound design is really good. Like you hear the zombies far away, and you're like, oh god, zombies are coming, and they don't groan. They make this kind of weird staticky noise. It's and it's more Silent Hill, and it's kind of uh, yeah. I guess it is more cool. it is more Silent Hill than it, I, I was getting kind of a Resident Evil vibe off of it because they give you the gun and it's totally ineffective. Yeah, we you, we've it's been too long since we've had a good suspense style uh, game. Yeah, uh, I think the the first Bioshock was the last really good one that I think came out. Mm -hmm. We've been missing that for a couple of years. So. But yeah, it's it's uh it's it's good. Uh, I'm like I said, I haven't gotten all the way through it because it's too scary. But the, the <laughs> um, and on mobile, I'm playing Steambirds, which um, just uh, I've been playing it on my Nexus Seven, and it's exactly the right size for a Nexus Seven, and you know it's got this beautiful touch interface, and it's just. I'm sitting there at I'm at Go at our at our cafe, you know, with my sandwich in one hand and playing Steambird in the other. Totally nice. fun. Cool. This That's is what touch gaming is about. Well, all right. I think we are out of time. So uh, we got we got no, no one else no behind else. there. No, thank We're goodness. Good. Mm. So um, remember, don't say JJ's name three times. Who? JJ. Stop. <laughs> no one. All right, and we'd like to thank you for joining us for Google Games Chat. We will see you in two weeks. I'd like to thank my panelists. Posse. Posse for joining. Entourage. And uh, we will talk to you. I walk around in front of Todd opening doors. It's <laughs> 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 pretty much how we roll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm the good looking one of the Entourage. Uh -huh. yes. That's no. I don't watch the show, so. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm, pro I'm probably E, I'm the shortest. Anyway, yeah, I will talk, I we'll, we'll talk to you guys later. You can, yeah. Billy, or you can you can fade us out. Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy. sorry. Jimmy. Backpack. 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 Backpack.